ninja, go ninja, go, go ninja, go ninja, go. Hello everyone, welcome back to Two Sweet MTG. Welcome to another Ultimate Commander Deck Tech. Today we're going to be looking at Yuriko the Tiger's Shadow. It is one blue and a black for a 1-3 legendary creature, Human Ninja. It has Commander Ninjutsu, which is pay a blue and a black to return an unblocked attacker to your hand. Put this card onto the battlefield from your hand or from the command zone tapped and attacking. It also importantly has whenever a ninja you control deals combat damage to a player, reveal the top card of your library and put that card into your hand. Each opponent loses life equal to that card's mana value. Okay, first things first, yes that commander ninjutsu ability gets around command attacks, meaning no matter what, if you use it, it doesn't increase the command attacks at all and will always just cost a blue and a black to activate. That alone is absurd and means that all we need is an unblockable creature to have access to our commander at any point in the game. That bottom ability, however, is what makes Yuriko one of the most powerful commanders ever printed. Not only is that ability card advantage as the cards we get go into our hand, it's also a pretty fantastic win condition as well, because importantly it scales with commander and deals damage to each opponent. Yes, if you play it fairly you'll be randomly dealing damage, but that's not why you clicked on a video titled Ultimate Deck Tech. To really make this deck scary, we'll be running a bunch of really expensive spells that have baked in cost reduction to them. We'll combine those with effects that let us manipulate what the top card of our library is, meaning that when our ninjas connect, we'll be dealing each of our opponent an absolute obscene amount of damage. We'll then also obviously be running a host of super cheap evasive creatures and the best ninjas going to make sure that we're always able to connect with the ninja. A quick note on how this video will work. We don't give full complete deck lists in this series. What we do is we give you a bunch of sections that make up the deck. We then give you a bunch of options options in each section so that you can choose the cards that work best for you and your budget. Any card we mention will be down in the description below. While you're there, give the video a thumbs up and follow the channel. Okay, first up, our first section is some unblockable creatures. These are going to be cheap and importantly numerous so that we can repeatedly put them into play, swing through and swap them out for an awesome ninja. First up we have cards that are technically ninjas themselves with Changing Outcast and Moth Dust Changeling. The fact that these can get through unblocked and then also just naturally trigger Yuriko's ability is just fantastic. Next we have some evasive creatures with some card draw or some card selection tacked onto them. You have cards like Fairy Seer, Spectral Sailor, Augury Owl and Baleful Strix. The fact that these cross over with other things that the deck wants to do is fantastic. Additional card draw is always going to be good, but scry effects that let us manipulate the top card of our library will mean we're more likely to put some high mana spell on top, ready to flip with Yuriko and deal a bunch of life loss to each opponent. Next up is Wingcrafter, a great cheap evasive creature that can importantly give a ninja some evasion when it comes in. And what's nice as well about Wingcrafter is that we can reset which creature we give flying to by just returning it to our hand with a ninja and then replaying it. You then have Demir Infiltrator, a nice unblockable creature that can also tutor up any 2 drop from our deck when we need it to. This honestly will be very useful as we're going to be running some super infactual cards that this can go and get. We next have Dothy Voidwalker, a great shadow creature that basically KOs any graveyard deck, while also letting us steal a spell from one of our opponents. Then next up we have Mausoleum Wanderer and Siren Stormtamer. Both great flying attackers that make it harder for our opponents to target our key creatures with any removal. You then have Hope of Girapur. Most of the time this is just going to be an easy to cast flyer, but against any opponents planning on casting a bunch of non-creature spells, like a Spellslinger deck for example, it can absolutely brick them. Then we just have a bunch of other options out there. You have free spells like Ornithopter, you have hasty evasive creatures with Gingerbrute, and then you have a bunch of really cool unblockable options, with cards like Good Old Lurker, Mist Cloak Herald, Slitherblade, Tormented Soul, Triton Shorestalker and Invisible Stalker. These are just great at topping up this section to get us to the 12 to 16 evasive creatures that we need to make the deck work. So we have our evasive threats, next up are those all important ninjas. Because of the top of the deck matters cards that we'll get onto, we only need a couple of ninjas ready to strike, which is why we're only running between 8 to 10 of them in the deck. First up we have some ninjas that draw us additional cards, with ninjas like Ingenious Infiltrator and Ninja of the Deep Hours. We then have some cards that give us card advantage from our opponent's decks, with cards like Nashi, Moon Sage, Scion, and probably my favourite ninja, Fallen Shinobi. We then have a board state in a can with Miss Syndicate Naga. This is honestly fantastic with our commander, as it just makes us a bunch of ninjas that'll all trigger Yuriko's ability, so we're flipping more and more cards and causing more and more life loss. You then have Hugger the Steel Wind, a ninja tutor 
on a ninja, getting one of the best cards out of our deck for that exact moment. But also importantly, it's a great mana sink as well to make sure our board of ninjas are unblockable and able to swing through. We then have Sakashima's Student, which can come in as a copy of one of the best creatures on the battlefield, but also makes it a ninja. Honestly, even just having another unblockable creature become a ninja will be good enough with Yuriko out. Master Splinter is up next, which has boosts all of our ninja threats up a little bit and making them slightly cheaper to ninjutsu into play. Then there's a bunch of other ninjas that you can choose from. Personally, I like Mistblade Shinobi, Moon Circuit Hacker and Skull Snatcher. Because importantly, they're all just a single colour to ninjutsu in, which is really nice and cheap and their effects are all very solid. In the most tuned version of this deck, I think that's all you need, but in more fun thematic versions, you can definitely run more of them if you're really feeling the ninja vibe. The last bit of the puzzle, as it were, is cards to manipulate the top card of our library. These are here so that we always have some high-costed bangers on top and ready to dish out to our opponents. First up we have the very budget-friendly Scroll Rack and Jace the Mind Sculptor. Specifically, the zero ability of Jace here. What these let us do is repeatedly take a couple of cards from our hand and put them back on top of our library. That means that if we have some expensive cards in our hand, we can use these to guarantee that we hit something huge when Eureka triggers, making sure that we maximise how much life our opponents lose. And what's truly fantastic about these cards is that they are repeatable, so we can do it turn after turn again and again. Second tier down from those, we have Sensei's Divining Top and the actually kind of budget Soothsaying. These only let us filter cards naturally on the top of our deck, but they still give us more control and more chances of causing a high amount of life loss. For some one-time options, we first have Brainstorm, an iconic cantrip that draws us a card while also letting us organise the top of our library. And then we have some tutors. Mystic Tutor puts any instant or sorcery on top of our library, Vampiric Tutor puts anything at all on top of our library, and then Limdul's Vault lets us repeatedly go through our deck stacking it as we want. The fact that these are instant speed means that we can wait until we are guaranteed to hit with a ninja with Yuriko out. We can then cast one of these to put some massive spell on top of our deck, ready to dish out death to our opponents. Next up is our card draw section, and yes I know our commander draws us cards, but having more just gives us more selection and things to do. First up we have some expensive card draw spells with some built in cost reduction. Firstly, Lorien Revealed can draw us 3 cards late game, or early on for 1 mana draws us a land out of our deck. Then Dig Through Time and Treasure Cruise are card draw spells that will cost 8 when we flip them off of our commander, but with their built in delve cost reduction won't cost 8 for us to cast them. We then have spells that draw us cards whenever one of our creatures deals combat damage to an opponent. You have things like Bind to Thassa and Reconnaissance Mission. I really love these cards, they might be better in more token based decks, but just turning every one of our evasive creatures into drawing a card every turn to me is just awesome. Then we have the slightly more generic and consistent enchantments that draw us cards every turn. Mystic Remora will draw us a couple of cards before the cumulative upkeep gets too high. Black Market Connections actually has more play in this deck as it can do the Phyrexian Arena drawy card thing, or it can actually make us a changeling ninja every turn. And then of course we have Ristic Study because it's Ristic Study. Good magic card is good magic card. Then lastly we have some smaller cheaper cantrips. They filter, they keep our deck ticking over, they're justification for us keeping some sketchy hands, they fuel our delve spells, and they're just really really solid. Next up is our ramp section, and like with most decks we want around 8-10 to 10 bits here to get our deck through the game. First up we start with a solid ninja with Prosperous Thief. This makes us a treasure when it or a different ninja connects for some damage. We then have Wayfarer's Bauble, a solid artifact that is one of the few ways of getting a land out of our deck in these colours. Then for the bulk of the ramp we're going to be using Mana Rocks. There's plenty of good options, outside of Soul Ring I would generally go for ones that tap for either a blue or a black mana, as we have a lot of cheap colour intensive spells that we want to be able to cast. And then yes there's obviously a bunch of good, very expensive cards that you can run in this slot. If you have a mana crypt, cool, run a mana crypt. If you don't, don't worry about it, it's not the end of the world. Just run a selection of the cards that we've already gone over. Next up we have our interaction section. We generally want to start with 8 bits and then go up from there the more competitive that our playgroup is. First up we have some awesome spells that can remove a key creature while basically being free to cast. Both Deadly Rollick and Snuff Out technically cost 4 for the purposes of our commander, but can both be cast for 0 mana, making them fantastic in the deck. We then have Submerge, which is free to bounce a creature to the top of its owner's library if an opponent controls a forest. And also, while importantly, doming our opponents for 5. Then we have some removal spells that have baked in cost reduction to them. Curtain's Call takes out 2 creatures, while having its cost reduced when we cast it based on the number of opponents that we have. You then have Murderous Cut, which is another great delve spell that we can make cheaper to cast. And then we have Never To Return. When we cast it to destroy a creature or planeswalker, it's just 3 mana, but if we flip it off Yuriko, it'll dome our opponents for 7, because that is the card's total mana cost. For a bit of enchantment removal, we then have Feed the Swarm, which is just a solid flexible card. Throw in some board wipes with cards like Toxic Deluge and Damnation, and you've got yourself an interaction section. But next up is a little bit of protection. When you can deal 10 damage to each opponent on turn 2, it can lead to people thinking that you're the threat. 
to stop their removal, we first have some free counter spells with Force of Negation, Fierce Guardianship, and Force of Will. They all have slightly alternative free casting costs that we can use when we're tapped out, but also have a slightly higher mana value than normal, so again, they just add to that damage that we're flipping off of our commander. Another expensive spell with a cheaper front side is Commit to Memory. The front half is a perfectly solid counter spell when we need it, and then the back half is just a draw seven, which is always going to be nice. We then have some very cheap and efficient counter magic, with cards like an offer you can't refuse and Swan Song. These importantly counter things that we're most scared of in this deck, i.e., targeted removal and board wipes, while also being nice and cheap to cast. Okay, we have the base of the deck, let's go over some dedicated ways for us to win the game. First up, we have effects that turn all of our creatures into ninjas. You have cards like Arcane Adaptation, Maskwood Nexus, Conspiracy, and Xenograft. You definitely do not need all of these, but one or two is very nice to have, especially when they turn our unblockable creatures into ninjas, meaning that all of them trigger Yuriko's life loss ability when they connect. Talking of ninjas, we have some very big lads next, with Ink Eyes, Servant of Oni, and Silent Blade Oni. The most tuned version of this deck probably won't run these if I'm being honest, but they are certainly very big and very fun, and I think they're great at giving us a big ninja option to flip off of Yuriko. We then have Tetsuko Umazawa Fugitive. This is a great card that can make a bunch of our smaller ninjas, including importantly our commander, unblockable so they can always get in for some damage. In a similar vein, we have the absolute flavor win with Cover of Darkness. This gives all of our ninjas fear, meaning they can only be blocked by black or artifact creatures. When all of our creatures are unblockable, we can cast a card like Nano Gene Conversion to turn them all into copies of Yuriko. This will mean that when they deal damage, each of them will trigger that draw life loss ability for each copy of Yuriko in play. We then have another way of getting those ninjas through for damage, with cards like Cunning Evasion and Grazalix Ilfled Scholar. With these, we can bounce our ninjas back to our hand if they're ever blocked, and then just ninjutsu them back in for an unblockable creature, ready to deal some damage straight away. We then have some big beefy creatures with built-in cost reduction, with Shadow of Mortality and Emrakul the Promised End. These are great if we flip them to cause life loss with Yuriko, but then we can just cast them later in the game for cheap to beat down our opponents. We then have some extra turn spells with some built-in cost reduction. We have the Miracle ability of Temporal Mastery, and then the Delve ability of Temporal Trespass. These are fantastic spells to hit off of Yuriko, but are also just great to cast if we have any kind of board state, as they can give us the extra turn that we need to push the damage through and win the game. And then lastly, because we're a deck that wants to run a bunch of tutors to put cards on top of our library, we have Demonic Consultation and Thassa's Oracle. If you have these two, you just win the game. You cast Thassa's Oracle, and then with its ability on the stack, you cast Demonic Consultation and name a card not in your deck. You'll then exile your whole deck, the Thassa's Oracle resolves, and you win the game. Marvelous. Okay, rounding off the deck with some utility lands, there's actually a fantastic amount that we can look to run. First up, we have creature lands. We have cards like Creeping Tarpit, Restless Reef, Blink Moth Nexus, and Mutavolt. They all either have some evasion or can actually turn into ninjas. These are fantastic in a grindy game of magic, as they'll survive any board wipes, and then we can rumble in with them to get Yuriko back into play. We then have cards like Halimar Depths and Rivendell. These can importantly help us manipulate the top card of our library, so it's something that we actually want. We then have a card like Ottawara Soaring City, which is some great bonus interaction with our opponent's boards. Then Seagate Restoration is a beefy card draw spell that's also a land that can come into play untapped. We then have Shizo Death Storehouse, Access Tunnel, and Rogue's Passage, which are all bonus evasion that are basically free to run because they're on lands. We then have Mystic Sanctuary and Takanuma Abandoned Mire. Nice bits of recursion for some of our spells, which are again free to run as they're on lands. And then we have Reliquary Tower. It's just a solid card in any deck that's hoping to draw a bucket load of cards like this one. Right, that's going to do it for today. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing. It would greatly help me out grow the channel. As well as liking and sharing, telling a friend, all that good stuff. But until next time, I will see you all soon. Goodbye.